morning to all. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, we're diving in. Um, I just do want to do a uh, unland acknowledgement. Today I'm actually joining from a different location. So I am on the land of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Select Indians, as well as the Chinook Indian Nation and the Clatsop Nahalem Confederated Tribes. And thankful for the stewardship of those tribes, as well as all of the tribes in the Salish Sea since time immemorial. As we talk about water quality, um, it, that is an important piece of our accountability to that stewardship and continuing to learn, center Indigenous knowledge, and to build relationships both personally and as a scientific community is an important part of these conversations. So, for those who were not with us, um, at our last kickoff workshop, wanted to just set the stage a little bit in terms of University of Washington Puget Sound Institute's role in all of this. So as many of you on this call were involved in, um, Puget Sound Partnership has a forthcoming marine water quality implementation strategy. And as with many of the implementation strategies, that included identifying technical uncertainties and many of those related to not only nitrogen, but modeling and how we understand water quality in the system. And so uh, Puget Sound Institute is complementing the work of many others in the region um, to focus on some of those technical uncertainties. Specifically over the next year, that includes a series of scientific workshops, which you all are at. Um, and we have several more coming up over the next few months. We also have convened a model evaluation group, which is really a, a set of experts from Baltic, Chesapeake, and elsewhere who can help advise our team as we're thinking about the, the tools that we continue to develop and can learn from the experience that they all have. The other piece of that is the modeling um, that our team has some capacity to continue to do. And central to that is making sure that we're expanding access. Um, we don't want to hold the keys and have all the information on our end. So certainly more about that on our website, um, but gonna turn it over here to Joel. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Marielle. Um, I'm glad you're all here this morning, bright and early. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Mario Larson and Stefano Mazzelli, uh, Stefano is in Australia on personal family business, but couldn't make it today, but we're glad that the two of them have worked very well together with um, others in the region to pull these workshops together. So thanks for those efforts. I wanna thank all of you for participating in this workshop and the other workshops. I think this is uh, obviously an ongoing discussion about water quality in Puget Sound that has been going on for a long time and will go on um, into the future. And it's important that we continue to all talk together and be open and transparent about exchanging information and data as we're going forward. So that's that's what these workshops are all about. The framing question for today is around water quality. Um, how do we evaluate water quality with the tools that we have relative to the needs of key species, food webs and habitats? Next week's workshop will focus more on the sort of latter part of that question about what different species, what their habitat requirements are with respect to water quality. But today we're focused on the tools um, that we have available and maybe the tools that we need um, going forward. So, um, Mario, I can we go to the next slide, please. Um, so we have a range of tools that are available to us, as you all know, um, and that we draw on to apply adaptive management and um, to evaluate the, the science. And those tools include both monitoring and, and modeling. And I don't need to belabor the point that those two um, sort of pillars of the science community need to work together and they need to work interactively with each other. So there's really a trade-off where there's a there's change of information between monitoring and modeling. Um, and that's what we're here about today. Um, and I think what, as you'll see from the presentations and from the, the work that you all do individually, this, this area has a wealth of both um, high quality long-term monitoring data, field observations of water quality in the Salish Sea. And we're also blessed with a lot of um, really high quality modeling tools that are available to us. So um, in some ways we have we have uh, a pretty rich environment here. Having said that, I think it's important that we continue to evaluate what we have and think about what those tools are telling us and, and, and use those tools to focus the issues so that we're, we're honing in on the most important issues and, and, and developing strategies around solving the most important problems. Um, next slide. 
Am I off? I have two, two screens now. Okay. So, and again, just to make a, another obvious point, this is early eight o'clock in the morning, obvious point time. Um, we understand that water quality includes a vast range of things. In fact, our program spends most of our time thinking about things other than nutrients. Um, but so when we think about water quality holistically, we want to keep our uh, kind of revision on all of these issues that are related to water quality in the Sailor Sea. However, for today and for the, the work that we're doing right now, we're really focusing on nutrients um, and specifically nitrogen loading and potential impacts. And we also want to say up front, and, and the obvious point is it's not just low dissolved, it's just not dissolved oxygen as a single parameter. Um, the impact, potential impacts of you know, nitrogen loading can include the things you see listed there. Um, many of these have been demonstrated in other ecosystems to occur at, at higher, at high nutrient loadings. And for many of these, it's, it's an open question whether they're either currently um, being felt in, in the Salish Sea or have a high potential of being felt in the future. So what, what does the monitoring data, what does the modeling data say about um, these issues you see listed on the screen here? Uh, so this is all in our minds, it's all in your minds, but today we're trying to focus on, on the nutrient loading question. So just a brief summary to kind of tee things up here. Um, you know, where are the changes that we're, we're seeing as a result of nutrient loadings and, 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 um, and why, did, why are those changes happening? Let's go to the next slide. Um, so as you all are well aware, this is not a universal um, homogeneous system. Um, it's a very, the Puget Sound Salish system is very complicated. When we think about low um, dissolved oxygen and the places where the dissolved oxygen is the lowest, um, is, is in these terminal inlets and abeyance. And this is a well-known phenomenon that's been, been well documented by many people that are on this call. Um, so it really isn't a sound wide, you know, one, one size fits all kind of situation. We really need to hone in on both the models and the field data point to the areas that are circled in the, in the, uh, in, in the chart here. So I think the solutions that we're talking about um, really need to be driven by the science and the science says that the, you know, we need to go to these problems. This is where the problems are. Let's go, let's go fix the stuff in the circles. Um, next slide. Um, the other important thing though to remember is, is it, it's also when, I mean, when does this happen? It doesn't happen uniformly 365 days a year. So let's look at what the models and the monitoring data say about the seasonality and the, the longer term variability. Of this. Okay. So the next slide, I think. So on the right is an animation. This is the result of the Salish Sea model with the biogeochemical um, elements running in it. And the point of this is this is running over an annual cycle for 2014. And the way this is this graph was created is this is an off and on kind of graph. So blue means that there's you're in compliance and, and a red means you're out of compliance. So there's no, there's new, there's no shading here. See, you're, it's either on or off. The point of this is to say that you see that the, the impairment, the, the lower wa uh, water quality conditions grow into these terminal embayments during the summer months. Again, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone on, on this call, but the point is, is like the questions need to be focused in, why does this happen there? And why does that happen then? Like what are the, what's driving those, the, those conditions? That's the problem that we're trying to solve. Next. Indeedy. And so as we dive into the, the monitoring section as an important tool, one of the themes that we continue to hear from many of the experts in the region is, in addition to the system level analysis of monitoring, that there's a, an opportunity to monitor, to analyze the monitoring data across different data sets at that basin scale to think about these long term changes. Um, at a more localized level, and also to think about those nitrogen impacts more holistically, um, ranging from not only the, the low dissolved oxygen, but also to the things like the, the compounding impacts of ocean acidification. And so one of the tools within that that we won't talk about in a ton of detail today, because we'll focus on this in one of our later workshops on uh, primary production and phytoplankton is that sediment cores are a unique tool to help supplement gaps in long-term monitoring when long-term monitoring maybe didn't exist in certain areas, particularly because it reflects the overlying water conditions. And so we're excited for um, uh, Sophia Johannesson to be sharing some of her insights that she's been able to derive from those sediment cores. 
The other piece as we think about this relationship between modeling and monitoring and the very iterative relationship of that is, um, you know, Salish team model suggested that wastewater treatment plant uh, loading is having an impact in, in some of those embayments in Woodby Basin. And so that has prompted some additional monitoring um, in the near shore in particular. Uh, and as we get data from that expanded monitoring, that'll not only help improve our uh, confidence in the model in the near shore, um, but also deepen our understanding of some of those nitrogen impacts and hopefully in the long term also speak to some of the broader water quality questions that are, are less nutrient oriented. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of what we're starting to to see here on the left for some context is just an initial mapping. It is not comprehensive, but it is intended to give you a sense of both the historical and the current ongoing monitoring that exists. Uh, and there's obviously a range of methods and, and nuances within that. Um, but recognizing that again, it's iterative um, as we as we answer these questions. And so with that, I am very excited to introduce Stephanie Yeager. Um, she's a marine scientist at the city of San Diego, um, but many of you will recognize her because she was with King County for many years, as well as ecology up here, um, and also intimately involved in the marine water quality implementation strategy. So with that, Stephanie, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Mariel, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for, for having me. It's a good uh, blast from the past to be able to join you now. And uh, this morning, I'm just going to share some analyses that um, I did while working with colleagues at King County and also the Department of Ecology, some um, what some initial analyses of long-term analyses of long-term trends can help show us. And also, I just want to mention that this is uh, in no means comprehensive. Um, there is uh, so many types of monitoring and I'm not going to have a chance to cover, to dive into the de details this morning, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a taste of uh, what's going on. Next. So when we talk about the, um, uh, when we talk about the Salish Sea, one of the important aspects of being able to protect the Salish Sea is understanding what's, what's going on and what's happening. So, um, we can use water quality indicators to give us an idea of, of changes over the long term. And uh, what, what I want was most interested in exploring too is how, how things are changing over multiple decades. Um, and so this is just sort of an initial comparison of two different um, basins in Puget Sound, looking at um, central main basin in Puget Sound, as well as the in the Strait of Juan de Fuca with using data from Department of Ecology, Western Washington, and from King County. Um, and I, I'll mention that I did these analyses a bit ago, but the um, from preliminary um, results that go through 2021, we're seeing that these same kind of patterns are holding true. So the um, one of the challenges of looking at um, environmental data is just the high, high amount of variability. As uh, many of you know, we see variability on the scale of minutes to days to seasons to years. Um, and so one of the tests that we can use to account for some of those large changes in seasonal variability is, is a Mankendall test. So in that, in that sense, we're comparing January to January, February to February, et cetera. Um, and so this is just looking at some dissolved inorganic nitrogen data from um, central Puget Sound. And what you can see is that we see a large amount of variability and over two decades, we're also seeing this uh, looks like a, a, an increase in dissolved inorganic nitrogen. Um, one thing with time series analysis, if you click over one more, Mariel, the, that the reason you really want to be careful with the period of record is that you can see um, you can see a different you can make a different observation depending on what years you choose, um, and so because there are these large-scale climate oscillations, um, changes in uh, reflux, changes in upwelling. So there's all these different um, interannual patterns that are going on. And so um, it's just, it's important to, if possible, if we can do 
and these types of analyses over multiple decades. So just to show a few highlights from, from Central and Sound and Sri Wanafuka is that, um, so we did see, I mentioned this uh, increase of dissolving nitrogen in the upper, integrated the upper um, 35 meters of the water column, um, as well as some, uh, in, in the contrary, we saw the decreases in the Wanafuka Strait. So what, what, what is interesting about this is that we can really find different patterns and different trends depending on um, which area of the Salish Sea we're in. Um, and then another interesting note is that the, the nutrient ratio of silica to dissolved inorganic nitrogen, um, oftentimes this can help to be an indicator of um, uh, potential stress and human impact in places that are um, heavily impacted by nutrient pollution like the Northern Gulf of Mexico. What, what was observed was a decrease in the silica to DIN ratio over, over a long, long time periods. Um, and interestingly, in Central Basin, we're seeing a similar increase in silica so that the, the silica to DIN ratio was actually increasing. On the contrary, we're not seeing that in the Wanafuka. Next slide. So for um, chlorophyll concentrations, the, the, the story is much um, less clear, and as I'm sure we'll talk more about in future workshops, um, that there's not a clear pattern that was observed um, apart from a single increase at one station over that 20 year record. The um, dissolved oxygen, interestingly, also did not observe any clear changes. Um, looking over a, um, a long time record, there seem, seems to be some some non-significant small um, increases in oxygen, but there's not a significant change in central page of sound. So one thing that can, that can help us, and I wanted to make a plug for, is to use, um, use historical data as much as possible. I think oftentimes what happens is agencies will report out on their own data, which makes sense. That's what the data that they are collecting. Um, but there, there's, there are really ditch, rich data records to use, like the Coleus data set. And so this was um, collected from the 1930s to the 1970s. And it's uh, it, the uh, frequency of, of uh, data collection varies a bit by stations. And there's, um, but there's just a, a lot of data. And one of um, Eugene Coleus's uh, Mantras was to, to, to try to share the data and to make it available for future generations. So um, I, I just looked at a, did an initial analysis focusing on the uh, Point Jefferson site, which is um, in northern central sound. And I picked that site because it was uh, there was overlap between the King County monitoring and the Coleus mo monitoring in terms of it was at the, the same spot. So looking at the comparison over the last um, century, is that there was pretty limited data for nutrients, especially nitrate. Nitrate analyses didn't really um, uh, get improved until the 1960s. Um, levels are somewhat comparable. The, the, uh, what was interesting by diving into this is that there was a clear temperature increase in, in deep central Puget Sound waters, depending on the, on the season, um, of half to one degree, and did not see any clear changes in salinity DO, which have much longer records than nutrients thus far. So the next slide. So just to, to look a little bit more closely at the seasonal differences with um, nitrate and silica. So this is just looking at the, the deep conditions. So um, just to get, get away from some of the surface processes that influence this. Um, and uh, you're looking at deeper than 140 meters. Um, the purple is the coleus data set for all the nitrate data available from that site. And then King County is yellow. And um, what we see in the central basin is, is that these uh, nitrate concentrations, the deep nitrate concentrations are pretty comparable with the interesting pattern in the, in the summer where it looks like the historical concentrations were a bit higher. And so I think there's an opportunity to really 
further dive in and delve in to explore the drivers for what's going on um, for these long-term changes. So um, just wanted to plug that this uh, Coleus data set is, I think it could be beneficial to the community to really um, dive into this more and more quality assurance, quality control of this data set is needed. It's, it's available publicly in EPA Storette. Um, there are some transcription and unit errors and things that I found, and I'm happy to share that kind of information with anyone who wants to dive into this. Um, but I think uh, that would be a, a good service to the community is to, to quality control this data set and get this available. So we can really, I think the benefit is understanding how things have changed over the last century. So just to briefly mention how this, uh, these sort of trends compare with what we're seeing in more larger scale Pacific ocean patterns. Um, there, I have a, there's a favorite paper that I, I like by Richie et al. that was, um, came out in 2014 about trends and variability in the Strait of Georgia. Um, and, I, and that they're very comprehensive with, the very, with how many variables they selected and also that they went into drivers. So um, I think a similar model would be great to do for the rest of, of the sales sea. And so they, they observed similar increases in temperature over time that we observed with the comparison with Coleus data set. The other thing that is happening on more Pacific Ocean scale is that we are definitely seeing widespread dissolved oxygen declines in the Pacific. And that's been shown across, um, across the West Coast, um, so in the Georgia Strait, but also across the Southern California Bight, as well as the shelf off of Oregon. Um, and at the same time, there are, what's been shown is general increases in nitrate in the deep waters, um, with one of the mechanisms thought to be that these, these waters are, um, are older, and so there's more time for remineralization, more time for the DO to deplete. Um, and so that's also a pattern that's been observed in some of these long-term data sets. So this is just another thing to keep in mind is understanding the, the context of what's happening in the ocean and how that influences the Salish Sea as well. So just to, to wrap up, just mention that um, where you are definitely the matters. And so as uh, Joel mentioned that, you know, um, terminal inlets and bayments are going to be more susceptible to eutrophication than places like the Central Basin and the Strait. Um, and it's really important to evaluate impairment indicators beyond just nutrient concentrations. That just gives us a snapshot, right? but we want to look and dive into other, um, other biological indicators as well. And um, variability is going to be present in any data set. And so I think having a consistent long-term monitoring is really a key to understanding these changes. And because we do have gaps in how we understand how the ecosystem works, I think having multiple biological indicators of different types of communities is going to really come in handy for understanding this. And also to keep in mind about the increasing temperatures and other climate change impacts that are happening and how these are gonna play a role as well. Next slide. So just, uh, just to end, I just wanted to give a little plug for my uh, current position. So um, one of the things that I found that has been very interesting that we're doing in the Southern California Regional Bite is that there's a monitoring program that goes on every five years. Um, that's a collaboration between over 50 agencies. And so um, I think, yeah, one of the benefits of doing this is definitely having perspectives and data from multiple organizations and being able to put that together. So just uh, wanted to throw that out as an example for, um, yeah, as a potential resource for, for monitoring collaborations and frameworks as well. And that's all I have. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Gordon. Gordon is an um, ecosystem ecologist at the University of Washington um, and has done a lot of work on isotopic studies that he's going to share with us today. Gordon, I'll hand it yes, over to thanks. you. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Stefano, Mariel, and I were just kind of chatting about stuff that was my lab was doing around isotope work. And they said, hey, 
this might be useful for this upcoming tools workshop. Um, so here I am to tell you about some of the work we're doing um, in the Puget Sound region, both up in the watersheds and down in the sound itself. And um, I've also kind of looked a little bit out in the literature on some other work that's uh, been using stabilized stubs to try to, that are relevant to nutrients. And uh, hopefully it's useful and maybe we'll spur some ideas for future studies. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we have, we have a couple of questions um, out there and they're questions that maybe could be informed by employing tools like stable isotopes, in particular stable isotopes and nitrogen is what I'm gonna focus on. And one of those questions might be, you know, has the end dynamics in Puget Sound changed over time and with human development? And you may wonder why I have pictures of a copper rockfish and a harbor seal, and they are relevant to this question. And that's, I'll get to that in a little bit. Next slide. Um, also, we might wanna know where's nitrogen coming from that is entering into the sound. And I'm a freshwater, freshwater ecologist by training. And so I tend to think about watersheds and um, you know, here's a, rough schematic of watershed and where some of the potential sources of nitrogen into Puget Sound. This would include nit nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere, uh, fertilizers or manure from agriculture, forest nitrogen, wastewater nitrogen, or just soil nitrogen coming in through groundwater, um, and then upwelling from the coast. Okay, yes, thanks. So, um, nitrogen isotopes, I think most people probably have some familiarity here, but just to quickly talk about it. Um, so we're talking about subtle variations in the stable isotopes of nitrogen. Uh, so this is the relative amount of 15 nitrogen, nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 14. So nitrogen 15 has an extra neutron in it. It's chemically identical. It's just a little bit heavier. And that, but it's heavier enough that we can measure it and look at the ratio of those two um, elements or those two molecules, atoms. Thank you. Uh, in various pools, and that actually gives us some information on where stuff might be coming from or how different processes might be changing those pools. And so this diagram on the right here is, is kind of a rough schematic. And I've got two isotopes plotted. I really just want to focus on the x-axis. This is the isotopes of nitrogen, which are reported in this delta N15 value in per mil or parts per thousand. And you can see there's some ability in general terms, there's definitely, you know, kind of devils to the details here, but you can tell certain fertilizers, particularly uh, ammonia-based fertilizers from kind of normal soil nitrogen that is um, probably derived from N fixation and um, more enriched higher values of this Delta N15 uh, tend to be the case when you're talking about sources that come from manure or septic waste. And that's generally derived from denitrification, uh, enriching that nitrogen in that heavy isotope. Um, so these, this is useful. There's other isotopes. Um, we've been doing work on the oxygen isotopes in nitrate as well, and that is informative. And that can be particularly informative with respect to um, atmospheric end deposition, actually. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna just do quick, three vignettes on isotopic studies that I, I've, that are in, have been done in the Puget Sound that are relevant to nutrients. Um, I'm gonna try my best to focus on the, more on the tool and the application rather than the res specific results. Otherwise this is gonna end up it, to be 15, you know, three 15 minute talks in 10 minutes. Um, so we can certainly get into some of that later. Uh, the first one here is really thinking about spatial variation in N15 using muscles who obviously don't move. Um, and this is a great study by uh, Jim West and uh, Sandy O'Neill's group out of WDFW. Um, it's an interesting case where they were really interested in uh, contaminants, actually. But in the process of doing that, they also measure N15, and we can maybe exploit that. Um, second vignette will be some work that's come out of my lab. This is looking at temporal variation in N15 in the food web, and I'll highlight that aspect to it. This graduate student, Megan Federn, um, 
and uh, postdoc Rachel Wellicky, who have looked at this in both the seals and the fish, and I'll give you some details. And then the last little vignette is um, looking at upstream, looking at river water nitrate and the isotopes in that river water nitrate and where what that might say about sources coming in from the watersheds. So next slide. Okay, so let's start. And again, I'm I'm really just highlighting kind of some different ways we can maybe think about using N15 in different organisms as a tool or in, in nitrate as a tool. Uh, so this map here shows uh, sites where mussels were sampled throughout Puget Sound. Again, primarily to quantify the contaminants in the mussels, but also at the same time, those samples were analyzed for the, the Delta N15. And that might give an indication of where um, nitrogen sources come from. And if you've advanced one, please. Um, one of the results that came out of this study was, so the, they took the results of these N15 that was measured in the mussels and compared them to the Salish Sea model. And um, I'll do my best to try to explain the X axis here. Um, my understanding is, is that this modeled wastewater treatment plant dye concentration reflects essentially this relative influence at steady state of wastewater treatment plant outfalls in the water or nitrogen pool in a particular location. And so there's a pretty clear positive relationship between N15 and what we would expect to be the influence of wastewater treatment plants. And that makes sense because wastewater treatment plants should have an enriched N15 value, right? They're the generally hasn't been looked at a lot, but you know, the expected N15 for nitrogen coming out of wastewater treatment plants is about 20 per mil. And background in the Puget Sound is generally around eight or nine per mil. And so you can see that as this kind of influence of wastewater treatment plants increases, that N15 is reflected in the biota, right? And so that's, again, kind of a key point here is that we're talking about the biota. We're actually making that link to the biota. Um, other thing about this graph I want to point out is the magnitude on the y-axis, right? So the total change across these sites is one per mil, right? And that's not very much actually. And one of the things that could be done with data like these is do simple uh, two source mixing models that say, hey, the background nitrate is suspected to be about eight, nine. The wastewater treatment is expected to be about 20, maybe a little higher. What's the proportion of the nitrogen in these mussels that comes from uh, wastewater treatment plants? And I haven't done the calculation, but I can look at these data and say it's pretty small. It's probably about five-ish percent would be my best guess. So um, two pieces of information. Um, is there spatial variation? Does it map on with wastewater treatment plants? And how big is the effect there? So that's a cool study, and I think more can definitely be done there. Let's go to the next slide. OK, super busy slide. But um, again, I'm just using this to make this point that um, we, well, let me back up a little and say, so. This study looked at the stable isotopes of nitrogen in amino acids of harbor seal skulls, OK? And that was done on harbor seals out of museums. And the skull collections range for about 100 years. So I think the earliest ones are about the 1930s up until um, yeah, just about 2000s, OK, so 70. I guess 70, 80 years is where, where it is. And so what does that tell you? Well, um, it tells you a couple things. One is we're looking at these isotopic ratios in the top predator in the system, right? And so that nitrogen comes in from whatever source it is, but it has to move through the entire food web of the Puget Sound to get to that harbor seal. Um, and so that's important, right? Because now we've gone from just asking what's what's the dynamics of the nitrogen that exists in Puget Sound to what's the dynamics of the nitrogen in the food web itself, in the biology. And um, so then what does the values tell you? And I'm going to, it tells you a lot of things. And we actually did this study to look at things like trophic dynamics of harbor seals in change through time. But one of the things we actually get is the delta N15 of phenylalanine. And phenylalanine is, a, is an essential amino acid that animals can't synthesize. And so it's passed without change up the food web. 
And it generally reflects the isotopic signature of the primary producers at the base of the food web. And so now we have a tool that is tracking the isotopic signature of the primary producers at the base of the food web through time because we went back and got these samples from seals out of museums, okay? And so uh, two interesting, important points, right? We're, we're honing in on the biology and it gives us another tool to go and look over time where we don't have direct data. And then while sediment cores are great and I'm really super excited to see the sediment cores, um, this is slightly different because again, we're honing in on that biology component. So next slide. Um, this also super busy. I did not have time. I just pulled these from the paper itself and um, did not have time to simplify it. But I want to point out this panel with the blue dots here. And so that's the delta N protein of this phenylalanine. And if we would expect if there were dramatic changes in the nutrient dynamics in the Salish Sea, we would see some change here. And that would probably map on with um, changes in population or changes in outfall from wastewater treatment plants or land use change or whatever. And we generally don't see that trend in these data. Um, this is on the right side is a multivariate time series analysis. Um, you can think of it like the Mann Kendall test that Stephanie mentioned, but rather than being linear, it's nonlinear. So we can look at nonlinear trends through time. And uh, the point here is that basically, if you look at this lower panel all the way on the right, the kind of most influential covariate on this value, this nitrogen N15 of phenylalanine is um, up is sea, surf sea surface temperature upwelling and a couple of climate indices. Okay, so it's suggesting that that's really what's driving the variation in this value in that N15 at the base of the food web. And there's not really this change, kind of consistent change over time. Okay, um, next slide. Uh, well, you, harbor seals, all right. Who cares about harbor seals? Um, so we've done a similar analysis on uh, fish, actually. So these are fish that were pickled in the UW fish collection. And just to put a plug in for the UW fish collection, it's one of the largest fish collections. I think it's the largest fish collection on the West Coast, or maybe the second largest, but we got a lot of fish in jars there. And so we pulled these fish out of jars and we did essentially the same thing. And I'm only gonna show data for copper rockfish here, but here's that same phenylalanine value um, and very little, no trend through time on that. And we repeated that analysis for one, I think there's one more fish. Um, there it is, thank you. So this was repeated for these fish. We've got um, uh, walleye pollock, we've got hake, herring and um, English sole, and none of them had a trend. And that's informative because these fish live at different places in the water column, right? There's pelagics here, there's small zooplankton pelagics, there's pelagic predators, there's benthic predators, there's benthic omnivores. None of them showed a trend in this. And, and again, I'll emphasize the point that we're, we're, we're zooming in on food web effects at this point. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so last one, last vignette is um, work by uh, my current graduate student, Elizabeth Elmstrom, and this is looking upstream. And this is uh, capitalizing on the Washington Ecology kind of routine sampling of water quality in major rivers draining into Puget Sound. And so these are the watersheds here, and here is a brief table of the, um, of the rivers. And so these are monthly samples over two years where we, where ecology is measuring the nit nitrogen plus a bunch of other parameters. And we took a subsample and measured the isotopes of nitrate in those. Um, and you can see these watersheds vary in terms of um, geomorphic attributes like slope, size and elevation, but also land use attributes like agriculture, um, urbanization, forest. And um, we have information, there's a bit of information on concentration here. And I just point out that um, these are pretty low concentrations across the board, actually. Okay, next slide. So what do, what do the isotopes tell you on this? So here, um, these are the two graphs on the left are all the Cascade rivers and on the right are all the um, Olympic 
rivers, which are only three, and really just focus on the upper panel, which is the N15 um, of that nitrate. And you can see there, there are seasonal changes and it maps on with the hydrology in the Cascades, but that pattern does not exist in the Olympics. Um, so we, we have seasonal effects, it's def and there seems to be a relationship with hydrology, but what is that relationship? It's actually inverse. So next slide, please. Um, in a few of those, those, I'll rewind a little, in a few of those, really just two of those, sorry, Mario, can you go forward? Thanks. Um, in two of those streams, so this is the Deschutes and the Nooksack are these two lines here. There's a consistent and high delta N15 with nitrate concentration, okay? And um, so this suggests that there is a, anth a anthropogenic source of nitrogen into that nitrate pool, either from humans or from agriculture, that's the people in the cows down there. And that's pretty consistent, it's high, it's consistent. And um, that's pretty well known. Those two basins have um, kind of known nitrate pollution issues with them. Here's what I think is maybe the more interesting result is next slide. All the other rivers show a pretty strong and consistent negative relationship between the concentration of nitrate and the river and the Delta N15. And so what that suggests is that whatever the source is that is getting added to that river, it is relatively depleted in nitrogen, which would be not the, the human source that we would expect. And it's my pet, we haven't nailed this down, I would say definitively, but my pet hypothesis here is this is um, soil nitrogen derived from alder, right? And it probably is a legacy of historical logging practices where we chop down a lot of forests and alder is regrown in many of those areas. Alder is an end fixer. It fixes nitrogen that comes in at about uh, delta N15 of about zero. And that nitrogen is accumulating in the soils and gets moved into the rivers. So, um, okay, next slide. So that, that, again, that's three vignettes of how we might take this isotopic tool and start thinking about different questions around sources of nutrients and what's going on. Uh, some potential next steps to talk about is, you know, continuing some of this monitoring, maybe expanding it to, to get some new looks that change over time or change over space. Uh, I'd really like to add some of this isotopic data to watershed N models, like the Sparrow model, and um, see if we can kind of match up some, some of the thoughts there about where nitrogen in rivers is coming from and see if that makes sense with the isotope data. And then uh, we can move from just simply trying to identify source, but trying to figure out process. What's changing in these nitrogen pools? Is denitrification an important process? Et cetera, et cetera. And there's um, opportunities for that as well. All right, that is it. Thank you, Gordon. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Joel again, and we're going to walk through some of the modeling and model interpretation side of this. After that, we'll get to some of the QA that we're seeing both in the chat, but also an opportunity for folks to raise their hands. So, with that, on to you, Joel. All right. I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel like I just Rank from a fire hose. That was a tremendous amount of information at 8.30 in the morning. So um, take a breath, um, take a pause. Uh, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, what I wanna focus in on are, I think two points. One is um, what do we need? What do we have to really focus on these near shore, these terminal um, inlets and embayments? And then to think about how best to present and how best to interpret the results of the models that we have available to us. So that's kind of the game plan going forward. Um, and again, it's this interplay between what data do we have, what field observations do we have, um, what models do we have, and how to play those two back and forth with, with, with a focus on these, these near shore areas. And again, the good news is we have a fair bit of data. We don't have all the data we need. We have um, ever increasingly sophisticated modeling tools to apply the, uh, to these, these questions. So um, the upcoming workshops that uh, Marielle mentioned earlier will focus in more, much more detail on some of these aspects of you know, the specific biogeochemistry of these models, including um, what are the physical controls on interannual variability, and particularly with the focus on these near shore areas, 
um, how important and how, how well can we characterize sediment exchange? That's always one of the bugaboos in any kind of dissolved oxygen model is getting that exchange of oxygen and nutrients across the sediment water interface. Um, what field data are available for that um, and how do the models handle that? Um, and then, as was mentioned, a workshop on phytoplankton and primary production and grazing is being organized by the, um, by the PSIMP group. So um, lots of details to follow. This is meant to be sort of a high level um, look at where we are with these different tools. And again, as Gordon said, I'm hopefully I'm trying to focus in on the tools and not the implications of the application of the tools for this workshop. Okay, um, so just to say a little bit more about, and this, the slide may, may, may make you nauseous, what you're seeing on the right-hand side is a simulation of the salinity from the Salish Sea model uh, for 2014. The point to be made here is that the Salish Sea model um, and the biogeochemical elements of the Salish Sea model calculates a large number of parameters in addition to dissolved oxygen temperature and salinity, the things you expect. And those are list, listed on this table. So the good news is, is in order to get the dissolved oxygen modeling right, you have to carry along, of course, all these other nutrient, all the other nitrogen species, all the other carbon species, all the other phosphorus species, and um, also the fluxes of materials from, from, from point A to point B. So the, the model actually generates um, a, lots of information that's ripe for mining to ask some of the questions that we would like to ask from a scientific perspective, like what is driving the um, lower dissolved oxygen in this terminal embayment. In addition, as I probably you know recently, I'm um, trying and his group have, have continued to refine and, and uh, expand the scope of the Salish Sea model, and they've added um, some of the other parameters, including the base of the food web as well, and um, a higher spatial resolution. The other thing to talk about briefly is just this idea that the model, you know, models generate information, models generate output, um, and how you interpret them um, sort of depends on your needs and you know, what your um, uses of the, of the model are. And there's, there's equally valuable ways of doing different interpretations of models. Um, the Salish Sea model in this region has been used, and other models have been used in this region in, in different ways. Um, one is to compare the output to a criteria of some sort, and you're well familiar with that. The dissolved oxygen standard is the work that ecology has done. In their reporting, um, the Puget Sound Partnership uses a non-regulatory indicator um, in their vital science program. Um, also, information is, can be, and is generated by the modeling um, that comes out of Triangle's group and, and, and our group at ecology. Um, and then there's um, the work that we're doing, which is really kind of asking a more fundamental scientific question, which is what is the water quality? Or what, is the, what is the composition of the water in different places and times in, in Puget Sound and how's that change? Um, so all three things are um, valuable uses of the model interpretation. Next slide, please. Um, the other point to be made is, is we're, we're aware of, and I think as we get into next week's workshop and, and go beyond, um, that it's not just, you know, how much dissolved oxygen is in the water. It's, you know, the organisms respond not just to quantity, but also to variability. Um, so we might think about things about um, the, you know, the minimum dissolved oxygen of the day, which is kind of what the, we, we're doing. It's kind of the standard way of looking at it. But how variable is that oxygen um, concentrations and can, you know, which organisms respond more to variability than to absolute values. Um, what is the rate of dissolved oxygen change? Some species may be very susceptible to a rapid shift in dissolved oxygen. Um, so it's the rate of change that's important. Also that can be predicted um, by, by a, a model. Um, how frequently does hypoxia occur? Um, you know, the, the, like any other insult on, a, on an organism, you know, they can perhaps you know, withstand a certain amount of stress, but if it, if it happens at a high frequency that causes different, different effects. Um, and of course, duration of the hypoxic events or, or the return time. And there's very nice work that's been done analyzing this in Southern California, the, the low at all paper that I would point you to. I think we're gonna spend a fair bit of time talking about this next week at the, at the workshop, so I'll move on. The point is that the tools that are currently in hand allow you to do the, those kinds of analyses in addition to the maps of the dissolved oxygen. Um, last workshop that we had, Martha, the Satula from Scorp had talked about the metabolic index at the kickoff meeting. Um, if you've missed that or have forgotten, 
that, I would suggest going back and to our website and looking at the 15 minute highlight video where she goes into some detail about that. The metabolic index um, combines PCO2 with the temperature dependent biological response to oxygen. Um, and the, the goal there is to sort of, is to define it like an aer aer aerobically available habitat. Um, in other words, like how much of the habitat is suitable from, a, from an oxygen perspective, but it takes into account temperature as well, which is, of course is, is, is important. Um, and this will be discussed next week. We have Tim Essington as one of the speakers um, at the workshop next week, and he'll go into some detail about thinking through metabolic um, indices um, and, and other ways of thinking about um, how to characterize the uh, water quality conditions with, with respect to the organisms. Uh, next slide, please. So one of our, one of our goals, and I thank Tarang and his group from at PNNL um, is we wanted to make sure that the modeling um, tools are available, are readily available to the community writ large. Um, so we've set up the, the CLEC Modeling Center that Trang is the director of. And we've also done a lot of work in um, taking a production level, taking basically the research model and, and creating a production level model that is, can be run um, uh, more quickly um, and generate a lot more um, scenarios. So. Um, we're now able to run uh, and do batches of like five or six runs overnight. Um, it takes a couple of days to crank through the data, but we really increased the bandwidth of running the models so that we can run many more scenarios. So that was a, that was a lot of work and we're now up and running operational on that. Um, so just a couple of examples of how different this exact same model runs can generate different ways of looking at the data. Um, I showed you this, this animation earlier um, now we're going to zoom in on Whitby Basin just to make the point that we're trying to get you to think about terminal inlets and embayments rather than all the Puget Sound. Um, so this is the same um, way of analyzing the data that I showed you earlier, which is just a are you in compliance or not in compliance at these sites using the definition um, as described in the earlier Puget Sound Nutrient Forum um, documents. Um, that methodology is currently under revision, and I don't want to get into that, but suffice it to say the model output can be tweaked. The algorithms to make these maps can be tweaked depending on whatever policy decisions are made about the definition of are you in or out of compliance. Okay. So that's one use of the model. As I mentioned, the other way to think of the model, and this kind of riffs off what um, Gordon was talking about, is we really need to think about where the fish are, where the biology is that we're trying to, to protect and to maintain habitat. So we tend to focus more on what is the volume of water that is um, as, is depleted in dissolved oxygen relative to a reference condition. Um, and you can think of this on any given day at any given place, you have a water column, right? And as I think you all are aware, usually the dissolved oxygen is the lowest in the bottom waters um, for a bunch of, a couple of different re fundamental reasons. But we can think about you know, what fraction of the water column is actually has lower dissolved oxygen and in the case where it's not well mixed, right, which is a lot, of, a lot of the Puget Sound. So then we can think about you know, maybe an area of two square kilometers, uh, but only a certain volume of that is uh, a, a water column is impaired, right? kind of an obvious point. And we do that each day um, and we can add it up over the year and we get volume day. So the way we have been expressing this is you know, a volume day of low dissolved oxygen is like a heating degree day. Let's, let's do it each day, figure out the volume of water in a basin that's impaired, and then add that up over the, over the year to get the total amount of, of low dissolved oxygen. And that's what this, this animation is showing. This is the taking the minimum daily dissolved oxygen values calculated by the CLC model for each day at each of the model, model nodes, and then um, making a map making an, an, an animation. So that's what we have. And then what we have begun doing is starting to run some scenarios. A model can be run um, you know, many, many times and it provides consistent results. And we, begin, we, we can begin to play the what if games that are of great interest. So just to give you an example of this, um, this is the percent this is the time series for um, the straight SOG is straight of Georgia. Bellingham is Bellingham if you put an extra H in it. Um, sorry about that. Um, 
And this is the volume of the water in it. It's a basin, I should have a map up here, but this is, this is, is a sub-basin of Puget Sound. And this is the fraction of the volume of water in that basin that is um, impaired. That is the dissolved oxygen is less than 0.25 milligrams per liter than what it should be relative to the, uh, the reference condition. Um, and you'll see that, as we pointed out earlier, that this is a summertime phenomenon um, that you know, during the winter months, the dissolved oxygen in, in this part of the Puget Sound is, is uh, above any you know, kind of impairment, but in the summer it spikes, right? Um, notice also the, the magnitude of the y-axis, this is 0.02% this is of the volume of the water um, is, is impaired in, this, in the summer months, okay, in this particular location. And we can have a long debate about whether this is, this is but one of many ways of presenting these model results. Next slide, please. The other point um, to make, and that is, is probably obvious, but the, the model calculates in three dimensions and calculates every, every day. So we can begin to explore how nitrogen parameters uh, and nitrogen species vary in space and time and how, and how the dissolved oxygen varies in space and time. This of course is really hard to do in a static two-dimensional plot because a lot of this is being driven by the dynamics of the system, right? We have load, high nitrate, low dissolved oxygen and water coming in at the bottom and mixing, mixing up. So it's a little hard to, this isn't a lake. <laughs> it's a little harder to interpret. Um, yeah, but just by looking at this, but the point is we can cut, we can slice and dice through the, these data and the model output results um, in any of a number of ways. So we began to play with this um, and do some scenarios. And it's sort of the obvious what, you know, what will happen if you do something kinds of scenarios and just to give, you know, sort of give you a sense of what we're, you know, the kinds of things we're looking at. So the top panel is the same thing I showed you before. The solid line is the, what's the reference condition. That's the best estimate of what the conditions are in 2014, as far as nutrient loads, hydrodynamics, meteorology, the whole nine yards. And this is the percent of the volume that is impaired under those um, baseline conditions, right? And then in that region, we, the beauty of a model is you can do things pretty easily, right? You can just, we just set the, the nitrogen concentrations in the wastewater treatment plant effluents to zero um, as a way of turning off that load and then re-ran the model. Everything else stayed exactly the same. All of the rivers, all the other wastewater treatment plants from the rest of the region stayed at their normal condition. We just turned off the plants. This is primarily um, Everett and then some of the small plants surrounding Everett. And you can see that the model responds, that as you decrease the nitrogen loads from the wastewater treatment plants, in fact, you do get an improved um, water quality. Um, and the bottom graph shows that. It shows that the, the percent change in the volume of water that's impaired um, is, is improved. So having said that, um, note the, again the y-axis. So we're, we're going from 0.025% impaired to perhaps 0.015% of the volume impaired. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, I think I'm done. Um, the point I want to make, and I'm not, um, is, is just to say that how you interpret the model results and how you make those graphs, um, we should really have serious conversations about that because you can really get a different interpretation of what's happening out there and the efficacy of different things depending on how you make the data, make the graphs. So I will stop there and turn it back to Mario. Great, well, and we've got some questions in the chat. So we'll start with some of those, but please feel free um, to also raise your hand if you'd like to add um, in the first question, Gordon, for you is from Mike Connor. Um, he has a couple about whether or not you've used SC isotopes, either of those, um, particularly in terms of being able to understand how N15 might be modified as it's transferred through the food web. Yeah, I saw that. Um, thanks for the question, Michael. Uh, so we've not done that. We've taken a different approach and maybe this got lost in the fire hose. Um, but the approach we've taken is compound specific isotopes. And so we're measuring, and this is with respect to the time series, because the point that you made is a very accurate and important one, is that 
Um, there may be changes in the baseline over time, but then there's also potentially changes in the food web itself over time. And by measuring the N15 and in individual amino acids, rather than just the whole tissue, which is the alternative, which is take all the nitrogen in, a, in the tissue, we're actually parsing that out and measuring N15 of phenylalanine, tyrosine, go through your list of amino acids. We do like 13 of them. Um, by doing that, we actually can parse those two processes. We can know the food web dynamic change. And that was actually our goal when we did the study was we wanted to look at changes in the food web. But one of the pieces of information we get is that phenylalanine number. And phenylalanine is, does not change dramatically as you move up the food web. So those food web effects that you were mentioning that don't occur in phenylalanine because phenylalanine is an essential amino acid that can't be synthesized by animals. So once it comes from the plant to the animal, it stays because it just gets passed. So, um, you know, other isotopes would be helpful too. This is the approach we've chosen to take. Thank you, Gordon. And Joel, I'll send this one your way, which is Kim was asking about how near shore is defined, um, considering both like depth and area. Yeah, good question that, that I don't have a good answer for. I mean, I think we've been fairly casual about just, you know, looking at those things and saying, oh, those look like a terminal embayments. I mean, obviously they're terminal in the sense that there's no large river or you know, freshwater system flowing into them. I think the point I would make is that we have to, you know, get past this screening point and then say, we really need models, we really need approaches to each of those, you know, almost separately, almost independently. So regardless of what we call them, I think that they share, with the exception of one, one major exception, they share sort of common traits, right? They're shallow, they're protected, there's not a lot of wind stress on them, um, and they're not getting a lot of freshwater flow. So they're, they're poorly, poorly mixed shallow systems with pretty good light penetration. The obvious exception of, of hook is hook canal, which is a completely different animal from anything else and needs its own, its own approach. Great, thank you, Joel. And then Trang, I'm gonna send this one over to you, um, which is, there was a question about how the model handles grazing, um, given some of the conversation around would-be basin and oyster production being very relevant there is kind of the prompt um, for, for that curiosity. And let me make you a co-host real fast so that, uh, that you can unmute. Okay, hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you, Trang. Thanks, Mario. Uh, yeah, the question is about grazing. Um, but before I answer that, uh, let me just offer clarification on the Salis C model. The Salis C model itself is a tool that goes beyond this nutrient reductions project. Uh, it's being applied to address many different questions, uh, metals, PCBs, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, harmful species invasion, uh, and, and so on and so on. Right? It's a diagnostic tool that's being applied for many different purposes. Its application by Department of Ecology is specific to the nutrient reductions project. And so everything that's being discussed right now is related to work that Department of Ecology did in, in their application uh, using dissolved oxygen as a indicator criteria. So the model has since then grown considerably uh, we now have zooplankton in the model. The application that uh, Ecology did uh, was with an earlier version of the model where grazing was treated as a uh, predation term and it was a fixed value throughout the entire domain. So, so it's a fixed rate of grazing in the work uh, that's being discussed uh, during this meeting. Uh, but since then, we have added zooplankton, uh, microzooplankton and mesozooplankton. Uh, they graze depend, depending on availability of prey. Uh, their prey is mostly phytoplankton. So 
if the model simulates phytoplankton with sufficient accuracy, you can expect to see higher grazing uh, by microzooplankton. And then correspondingly, we also get mesozooplankton growth. So calibration of zooplankton data uh, uh, with zooplankton data has been completed and it was done over a period of five years from 2013 to 2017. We actually went over the marine heat wave period during which we reproduced the zooplankton data uh, collected by Julie Keister of UW Oceanography. And so we have some reasonable confidence that zooplankton growth and die off is reproduced properly. So we assume their grazing is also being reproduced reasonably. And so, so the answer to that question is zooplankton grazing varies depending on location within Salish Sea. And where you have more primary production, you get more grazing. That's the sim simplified zooplankton model. Thank you very much, okay. Trang, for that clarification and distinction, as well as the insight onto the grazing. So I'm going to do a time check here, and we are going to shift to the interactive portion of this. I know that we've got a few um, additional questions in the chat that we'll be sure to, to follow up with folks uh, directly about. As we're shifting here, I dropped again that link to the Jamboard because we've got a lot of people on for this discussion, and so I want to be able to, to respect that there's different uh, comfort levels and communication styles, and also that this Jamboard will be available over the coming weeks so that um, folks have some time to also digest and think about this. And so, you know, as we're talking about this focus on embayments and nutrient impacts more holistically, and recognizing that the Salish Sea model generates a lot of additional um, parameters beyond just dissolved oxygen, we want to know for for many of you who do a range of, of research and work related to these broader nutrient impacts, you know, what existing parameters would you like to have access to and, and why? Um, and so feel free to start to drop some of those ideas into the Jamboard itself, but also we'd love to hear ideas here. So raise your hand and we can unmute. And while folks are thinking, what I'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and actually open up that Jamboard too. I'll let it load. And so for example, I'm curious for, I see some folks on here who do work around um, HABs, um, you know, what sort of things would you like to see? Okay, Scott, I'm handing it over to you. Hey, thanks. That was fast. I, I'm just curious. I, I'm pretty sure we have Parker McCready here, and maybe someone, Parker, I'll suggest, could talk about other models and how uh, the the sort of whole, whole portfolio of models can be helpful here, and what we learn by um, bringing in other tools. Sounds great. Um, Parker, do you want to talk about that? And if so, I will find you and unmute you. Yeah, great. Uh, this is Parker McCready here. I don't believe I'm able to show my video, but um, so there, uh, there are um, a couple of other models in the region that do similar things to the Sailor Sea model. Uh, one is run by uh, Susan Allen at the University of British Columbia. It's called Sailor Seacast. And one is the one that I run at University of Washington called Live Ocean. And they, um, uh, with new funding from uh, King County Wastewater, both those other models are being brought into the sort of um, intellectual dialogue here of uh, wastewater treatment plant loading. And so we're, um, yep, we finally have funding to do kind of multi-model uh, experiments or, or, or the same experiment with three models is basically what's gonna happen. And this will contribute substantially to the 
the, the uh, issue that Marielle mentioned at the start of this workshop, which is the word um, confidence. That is, you know, how confident are we in a model result? And um, there's a lot of different ways to get at that. But one is just using different models that were put together by different groups with different tools for different purposes. So it's, um, I'd say it's a comeback in six months or a year and we'll have more to say. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Hey, Mario, can I jump in real quick? Just go for it. I'm gonna make a broad, I'm gonna broad, broad invitation to 107 people. Um, so we have a kind of a tech user group of modelers who meets at UW periodically um, in person or remotely. And it's a good chance to get, if you're really running into the weeds of water quality modeling, that's the place where grad students and faculty and people from the outside community come and talk about the ins and outs of, of Puget Sound water quality modeling. So if you're interested in that, let Mario know and we'll add you to the mailing list and the more the merrier. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Next up, we'll, I see Mike Connor. I'll unmute you. And feel free also- Can, can you hear drop, me now? Yes, we can now. I was gonna say also feel free for others, drop comments, ideas of what you would like to be able to have access to and play around with for your own work and research um, into the chat as well as the Jamboard too. Um, so I, I think it would really be helpful both to the modeling, but um, beyond the modeling, it's really helpful to have a gut feeling for what's happening in the sound and, and the Salish Sea and what the drivers are. And for phytoplankton productivity, there's times in the sea when it's light limited, there are times when it's nutrient limited, and there are times when it's grazing limited. And those major processes are crucial for understanding in the future for managers to understand okay, where are we sensitive, when, and in what locations in the sea? And as we went into this big, uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay big DO decline this summer that was just disastrous, happened right outside my window. Um, and a lot of it was, we've had the nutrients all along, but we had a very changing light uh, light scheme. And that's also happened in a lot of big estuaries around the US big issue around New York City where they've had a lot more um, less wind and less mixing. So it would really be helpful as we show the sound to be clear that we've got good data on light, on grazing, because those are gonna be crucial model drivers at certain times. And if without data, that's, that's gonna be impossible to convince yourself the model's right. And as much as I like zooplankton grazing, given all the aquaculture that we see in the sea, um, I suspect that uh, bivalve grazing is a much bigger player. And it'd be really uh, nice to, again, we could look at different areas of the sea where bivalve culture is huge and try to say, okay, are we seeing that impact? Um, anyway, I think, as much as I like the modeling, under, having a gut understanding of the major driving forces for production and uh, water quality in the sound requires that we interpret the data in ways that you can explain it to the common oceanographer so that they're just not looking at a model number change of 0.0%. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm taking a look for other hands. And again, this is a start of a conversation and one that we will also continue next week as we talk about um, biological integrity with Tim Essington and others. Um, so it's the idea to get wheels turning. Um, Gordon, I see your hand. Do you want to chime in? Sure. I, I have a um, data I don't know, uh, model request or question for Terang actually. Um, you know, I showed the plot from the, the muscle study that was looking at the isotopes, which would have, would indicate something about how much wastewater treatment plant nitrogen are, exist in the muscles. And it was related to this dye value, this kind of 
electronic die that's run through the model. Um, and I guess my question is, is there a way to turn that axis into the relative amount of nitrogen that comes from wastewater treatment plants versus other sources, which Absolutely. would be more yeah. directly comparable to the isotope value? Absolutely. Uh, we can certainly run those scenarios and then you can compute relative contribution uh, of different sources. That particular plot was created by Andy James and his group who wrote that paper. Mm -hmm. And they requested me to uh, provide them something that they could scale off of. So for that particular experiment involved releasing dye from all the outfalls, all the marine outfalls that come into Salisy, uh, a fixed concentration value of one unit, okay, and starting from zero, right? So we release dye from all these outfall uh, for a year, then the next year, and the next year, and it took three and a half years before Salisy uh, reached dynamic stability that the dye concentration afterwards did not keep increasing. And they converted those dynamic steady state values after three to four years to dilution ratio values, okay? And then they scaled off of uh, nutrients loading information that they probably got from ecology to come up with that plot, which is, which is hard to interpret. But this is how I understand model results were used in that work. Yeah. And then I'll take this opportunity to also respond to the comment that Mike, uh, I think it was Connor who made about uh, light, nutrients availability, and all those factors affecting phytoplankton growth. And, and also not to forget the influence of the strength of exchange flow. Uh, interannual, interannual var variability that you see depending on the freshwater flow that comes in. So over 10, 15 years, we have actually looked at all of those things. So folks coming to this meeting may suddenly say, oh, what about light? We didn't see any slides about the light. That doesn't mean we haven't looked at it, okay? So Department of Ecology conducts monthly monitoring at 26 stations where all these parameters are monitored. And we have gone through extensive uh, calibration to ensure that the influence of interannual variability, changes in loading, light availability, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the bloom that happens in spring when light suddenly becomes available. If all of those things are not factored in properly, you simply cannot match the data. <laughs> Even if one of those things are off, we can see that the model is off. So it's only after a long period of testing that we have got it to a state where we think most of the environmental parameters uh, that are significant, and that can be seen in data directly, you don't need a model to see those effects are being reproduced properly. So yes, it will really help to have more models reproduce all of those phenomena at the same level of quality and then confirm that the CLST model was indeed providing good answers. But Joel said the right thing. It's a model. It has limitations. How you interpret it is entirely up to you. Uh, compliance questions, or whether uh, the effects are ecologically significant, that is beyond the model. So to say CLEC model says that, I cringe when I hear CLEC model says that. It is someone's application of the CLEC model produces results that are being interpreted in some way. So that's all I have to say on that. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Tarang. And taking a quick scan for other hands. The other piece of this, you know, is we 
shared a couple example visualizations to turning point about how you can interpret data and visualize that because that helps us to, to answer different questions. And so throughout all of this, it, um, question for the group is, you know, what additional modeling and monitoring tools would be useful? And so when we think about, for example, even just dissolved oxygen and the different ways in which we visualize that, are there other ways that you would like to see that information visualized? And then beyond that is, as we're thinking about these other impacts, are there other ways you would like to see those? This can be food for thought um, as we continue to move forward. Um, I see a hand, let me find you. Is it Joel? Joel, go for it. I think there is my hand. So I, maybe this is for Gordon, maybe it's for others, but I, and, and Mike kind of raises this point. I mean, to what extent do we understand the impact Impact of aquaculture on all this stuff is it? I mean, a million pounds out of pen coat sounds like a big number. Um, is that is anyone modeling that? I have no idea. <laughs> all right, that's on our to do list. I I get a sense that somebody is, but I know there's there's definitely been work done on looking at the nutrient you know nutrient trading. Like you know, can you give does aquaculture get an offset for, you know, basically in essence, taking nutrients out of the system by uh, taking out their products. So I think that that would be maybe something we look at down the road fairly soon of like, what do people know about the impacts, both positive or potentially negative of, I know I'm not talking about antibiotics and all the other, you know, I don't want to get into the aquaculture morass, but just specifically to, is there enough aquaculture um, in place in Puget Sound to be affecting the sort of the nutrient mass balances. Michael. Michael, you should be able to unmute now. I think it's really an important issue to to look at, and particularly changes over time. There's still a large debate in Chesapeake Bay as to whether or not the uh, changes in water quality in the bay are driven by the fact that they overharvested oysters. Um, that NOAA has always played that as a strong piece, which has influenced how they've uh, changed the model. Uh, in the last few years. Um, and I, again, it, I, it gets to this point of, Tarong made an important point on exchange. I, I left that out, but showing those things, it's important that more than just the modelers say, okay, we're making the model number work. It'd be good, good to see how these drivers change. So as you're doing the interpretive studies uh, year after year, defining the year, it'd be nice to say, um, Rocky Geyer it, has done a really nice job in Mass Bay of uh, looking at uh, characterizing uh, the different years in, uh, are we seeing a lot of water coming in from the Gulf of Maine? Uh, how's it compare uh, to what we've seen historically? And having some rough back of the envelope uh, ways to describe how the sea is functioning year after year or different parts of the sea is functioning is crucial because I, I suspect uh, uh, so certainly for aquaculture you can see a much bigger difference um, in production in the hood canal and so it would be interesting to start to try to tell those stories and go beyond I, I, I models kind of give you a nice uh, several they can do things that you can't do otherwise, but it, you need to have some gut feeling of how the system's working that you can explain in the 101 oceanography class on Puget Sound that uh, everyone can understand. Thank you, Mike. And I would just point to the, I, I think the um, Marine Waters Group does that annual synthesis. I think that's a good starting point for Mike, what you're talking about. I think what it, and I, and it's a volunteer effort, so I don't want to, to make this sound critical, but what it lacks is kind of that point. I'd like, they really 
analyze that data asking these specific questions. And I think that that would be a good um, expansion of, of that effort. So they 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 do go through, and I think they do a, a really good job of summarizing like what how did how did the Puget Sound work last year? Like what was you know was it a wet year? Was it a dry year? What's going on with that kind of stuff? But there's more work to be done there. What point will take? And Scott, I see your hand. Yeah, I just want to pick up this thread of these these annual reports have been really wonderful, but I think we're at the point where we need, and, and maybe this is what Michael, um, or is one way to uh, to address what Michael's suggesting. Um, and it's funny, I think I'm looking again at Parker as I say this, you know, may, maybe the Puget Sound Science Review needs that synthesis of, you know, how, how is phytoplankton um, controlled? What 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 are what's our conceptual model? How does that play out in different kinds of years? That sort of thing. So just piggybacking on Joel's comment just now, like I I think there is something we could try to do differently. And in the spirit of um, a workshop we had a couple of years ago, like wh where do we have consensus? What what are sort of the unknowns? And could a synthesis? Um, and I like the idea of for the for the common oceanographer we don't have to boil this down too simply but as long as um even i who's not an oceanographer but feels pretty adept in this can can understand what we're all thinking together and then um sorry to go on so long but i want to change i want to bring up um a, a different direction and i'm going to admit this is a little uncomfortable um but the mentions of confidence um make me think about you know what what creates um, credible work and work that that people will feel is legitimate. And I love the fact that Parker was able to tell us about new funding for modeling. But the fact that he mentioned uh, King County as a funder um, is is going to raise some eyebrows. I don't think it necessarily should, but it will um, because People who have money have motivations on how they spend their money. And I, I don't think we, we should necessarily be suspicious of people's motivations, but but we need to understand those and they affect us. So maybe there's a little bit of an invite here for Joel, Michael, Stephanie, if she's still with us, just to talk about how um, these kinds of things are well funded by different sources in different systems and and how we get to the point where it all still feels legitimate and credible. Joel, I'll let you start off on that. Thanks, Scott. Um, so yeah, let me let me say a couple of things. I've this is the first time I've encountered in my career people questioning what we're doing based on who's funding the work. Um, I've never had that happen before until we got involved in this in this particular project. So I find it personally kind of insulting and not uh, not understanding what the role of the universities are and the research community is in this in this overall game. So um, having said that, you know, I think that there's we found ourselves in this place where um, on this issue particularly it feels like it's become a kind of criticize the messenger as opposed to the message um, kind of situation. I think as scientists we have to you know, keep our heads up. And I'm glad you all, you know, 100 of you have decided to spend your whatever day of the week this is with us and have to continue to have this conversation. Um, I think those who, those who uh, elect to conclude that the work is somehow compromised because of the funding source are, you know, it's their, it's their loss. Um, you know, I think if, you know, and I'll stop there. Uh, Michael and Stephanie can weigh in. I can speak um, a little bit just about my experience in um, Southern California, Bite, and something that I really appreciate about uh, about the atmosphere thus far is there's been a longstanding um, relationship between organizations um, and SQUIRP, which is the Southern California Coastal Water Resources and Protection. They've been um, they are funded by wastewater dischargers as well as uh, 
regulators. And um, so it's, uh, I think what I've definitely appreciated about um, the, the regional work here is that the idea that everyone is brought to the to table and, um, and that I think is a really important part of science is to be able to be collaborative and to continue to have those open conversations. So um, certainly I think that's been useful. And right now um, we are going through a, a, doing a similar biogeochemical model and um, to understand potential impacts from nutrients as well. And um, doing some, did a series of uncertainty workshops and now we're um, getting the stages of identifying what the gaps are that we want to address and um, you know working through a technical advisory group for that and trying to um, just take a vote. Ultimately it comes down to all the all the agencies get a vote. Um, we're taking votes about what we want to prioritize. Um, independent model review was certainly one of those and it's uh, it actually was suggested by Squirp to go ahead and have the, um, the those that are regulated, so the wastewater discharges, to fund that that work and to kind of help organize that. So, um, yeah, I think ultimately there it, there is uh, there are going to be um, areas where we need to do more work, we need more improvements, areas of disagreement. But I think having having those relationships and having the open collaborative spirit, I think is really, um, has been a, a, a benefit and is going to benefit the science and the outcomes in the long run. Just my, uh, just my two cents about that. Thank you, Stephanie. I see we'll go Gordon, Karang, and then Michael. Um, yeah, just, maybe I'll just bring a perspective. I, I work in fisheries every once in a while, and this question, about funding comes up a lot with in fisheries about whether fishing industry should be paying for some of the studies. And um, I would just argue that we should maybe think, think about this a little differently and say, hey, guess what? In the case of fisheries, the fisheries are the resource user. In the case of nutrients in Puget Sound, King County is the resource user. They're the ones that are um, using the sound as a resource and they should pay for it. Right. If they want to use it, they should pay for it. And so it's entire in that view, it's entirely appropriate that they fund it because they're the user. Thank you, Gordon. Trang. Hi. Yeah, I'd just like to chime in. The discussion about confidence raises questions about the quality of the model. So I want to say that we have a very high level of confidence in the model, uh, but like all models, the CLC model also has limitations. So the moment you start go, going beyond that, those limitations, uh, the use of the model uh, beyond, what it's, uh, beyond what it was designed for, you get into areas where folks can question the performance. So nearshore intertidal areas, this particular version of the model is not suited for. So, so in terms of the confidence in the model, the multiple years and consistency with which it continues to reproduce observed data at the set 26 stations in the Salish Sea uh, gives us great deal of confidence. Okay. Uh, but when you do use it beyond its design uh, capability, then there is uncertainty. There's uncertainty in inputs. There is uncertainty in calibration. Uh, but that confidence continues to increase as we, in, uh, as we continue to increase the number of years. So for example, first we had done model using just one year, year 2014. But we soon realized for that calibration to hold, it must withstand interannual variability and marine heat waves that go, go by. So we have since then improved the model and now we gain more consistency with all the variations that can happen in the input parameters of forcing, right? And so there's difference between confidence and accuracy. So 
if more models were come to play and if they can reproduce the data at the same level of accuracy, then we can test the models if the, if the response to changing scenarios or changing nutrients uh, models provide the same answer or not. And then having multiple models confirm or to, or to give a different answer would be informative. So I really welcome uh, any opportunity to have more models come in and it's really doesn't matter who funds the work, so. Thank you, Trang. Mike Connor. So uh, we have uh, run through, I've run through this issue uh, both in Massachusetts with uh, MWR, Mass Water Authority, where almost all the funding and science was done by the agency, but uh, the way we handled it to get public buy-in was to have an outside uh, set of scientists come review the work and with the government participation and the nonprofit uh, participation. To get... Ultimately, the goal on all this is not to, you're never going to get the right answer. And as Tarong says, there's always going to be uncertainty of around your results. The issue is to have some consensus amongst all the players as to what the data say, and then to argue about uh, uh, how how much you want to have of safety factors. Um, so in SFEI's instance, we included, unlike Squirp, we included the NGO community uh, on our board. Um, and to try to get everyone to sort of eventually buy into what solutions were workable. And I think that Joel's done a tremendous job in having this outside science advisory board. These are top-notch people that um, he has on that in that group. And I think that'll be that's the key for uh, saying that the data the quality of the data that you're coming up with are, are as good as you can do. And also, as Tehran said, to say, hey, this is the strengths, these are the weaknesses, this is the uncertainty. We can't wait till the perfect result comes through. We need to make decisions with different levels of uncertainty. And so they can say, okay, this is where our uncertainty is. And then public agencies, you need to decide from there. So I'm really glad to see uh, Joel's push with this outside science advisory group. I think that's a brilliant idea. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And the last thing I'll say on this is just, you know, an open invitation in that part of how with any power dynamics you balance is by having engagement. And so for us, we're very committed to having conversations broadly um, and, and be that in these workshop forums, but also one-on-one. -on -one. And so if there are specific things where people have questions and want to dive into the weeds or have ideas in terms of what would help to, to answer some of the scientific questions or build some of that accessibility and transparency, which is a big part of why, as you saw, we're going to be making those scripts um, available and, and just have that increased transparency, please reach out and, and know that that is an ongoing conversation there. So I'm looking and I feel like we have touched on most of the questions in here. There's some small ones that will, well, as I said, follow up directly with individuals, um, but appreciate the robust conversation and, and the curiosity um, from this group. And would just say that, you know, the Jamboard again will be available. And so whatever way is helpful to, to share thoughts, um, please feel free to, to add them in. Um, and then just a reminder that we do have um, that not only will the materials for this be available, but we do have the upcoming workshops. And the, the most imminent is next Thursday on biological integrity of key habitats and species. So Jakob, who is on the model evaluation group and has done work in the, the Baltic, um, will be sharing some of the insights there. And then Tim Essington will also be sharing some updates on research done um, in the region around some of the biological integrity aspects of that. Um, Joel, any final closing thoughts that you want to share? Um, just to thank everyone for their 
participation today and for the good conversations. And, I, and to echo what Mario said is that we, we, you know, we're committed to continuing this open and transparent conversations. I think we, we hold dear this, this you know, science community role. Um, so, and we're always available to come talk to anyone at any time about what we're doing, what we're up to, and we hope you to share the same open door policy and let's just keep talking. We have some really substantial issues to resolve among us um, related to Puget Sound. It's a rapidly changing environment and we, we have to get good at this. So thanks for joining us.